Now I'm getting at something. The Caucasian going into the caves, having to be pulled out. Now, the way they broke loose, but even after they got them out of Europe, they still couldn't sally forth. They say, well, look, ain't no sense in us going down here trying to take over Africa and all down there. That's, that's out. Them, them niggas too bad. I mean, you know, we got them off of European soil, but we better not go down there messing with them. We tried that for 300 years and got wiped out. See, we need to find some place where they ain't. Okay? So, there was a man said, I think I can handle that. I think I can find a new place for you to go, a new world, a whole new world, where you can set up and by the time they get wise to it, you'll be too strong for them to do anything about it. They said, yeah, but uh, how are you going to do that? And he laid out his plan. And then there were those who jumped up saying, well, you'll drop off the end of the earth and all this, man, y'all crazy. Y'all but y'all should have listened to them Muslims while they were over here when they had the university down in Cordova. Y'all should have studied some navigation, found out the earth is round. It ain't square and flat. So they said, but it takes a lot of money. Now, the old wives tale that you and I learned in school was that Queen Isabella sold her jewelry and financed it. She sold it to who? I mean, who did she sell it to? That's crazy. There were two Jews. One was the minister of the exchequer, <laughs> or the treasurer, as they call it today, and another one who was a financial deal who dealt with the real estate owned by Spain, who together talked the king and queen into financing Columbus' trip, because they are the ones who needed their promised land. So in 1492, all of the Jews were supposed to be run out of Spain. But these Jews didn't have no Jewish names. They had Spanish names. And like they do everywhere else, they melted into the population. They were nice, good little Spaniards. Okay? But they were looking forward to their Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. And they financed Columbus's trip, talked to Queen and King, to finance Columbus's trip to found New Jerusalem. So Columbus, a half original man, broke out of the chain that we had him in. A half original man who came to the shores of America having in him the blood and the nature of the people, the original people who were already here on this continent, these continents, and also the blood of those who would be rulers of the continent. Same pattern, right? Same pattern. Only one who can liberate them has to be one who got the blood of both people. So they can set up shop. And their history is very long. We'll go into most of it at a future date. As we go along, you'll be learning. We're just, this is orientation. This is not the full thing. But when the, they got over here, the Jews got over here and picked out their spot. The Jews out of, they didn't come from Spain. The ones who first came over here to settle were the ones who were in, at that time, the financial capital of the world, Holland, the Netherlands. So the Dutch Jews came over here from Amsterdam. And so when they picked out their little spot, they named it New Amsterdam. Okay? They then set up the slave trade. They set up companies that owned the ships, bought the slaves into the shores of North America, the Jews. Okay. Now, they got us over here, and all of this was fulfilling prophecy. We've been down there in the jungles now to 50,000 years now. We're conditioned to go through. You know, it's like you do with gold. You try it by fire. That's what the Bible says, right? Gold is tried by fire. But you know, when gold comes out of the fire, it still ain't quite pure. You got to drop it in the acid. So we, after 50,000 years of fire, we had to come over here acid test. Now before they got us over here, they went over, they had uh, Chinese 
indentured service. I know you're seeing some of them old cowboy movies. You saw some Chinese on the railroad and stuff like that. Yeah. Cooks and all that. Launders. But they could not, when they got ready to develop the South, they couldn't take the hard living that they put on them in the cotton fields. They died. Naturally, the first people they tried were the Indians because they were already here. They couldn't handle it. They died. But they found the people over there that the other Africans, listen to me closely, that the other Africans were glad to get rid of. The Arabs who had come in to North Africa were glad to get rid of. So the Arabs and the Africans got with the Jews. Said, we got some folks for you. Try them out. And we came over here we not only survived, but we thrived. Our birth rate was, was scaring this man to death. That's right. The worse he treated us looked like, the healthier we got. We didn't even have all of the oil. We used to show him how to treat his ailment. They get sick, we go out in the woods and dig up some roots and stuff and come back in and make a tea and bring them through it. <laughs> we were in out there in the winter time with one sack on, they catch a pneumonia in a heated house with clothes all on them and piled up with blankets. They catch a pneumonia. We out there running around barefoot with a sack on. And they even get to get the sniffles. Understand? All right. So now all of the trial that we went through was not during slavery. Our greatest trial, we were being prepared in slavery for. Now, what about our beloved Muslim brothers? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that if Muhammad had known we were here, he would have come over here himself to get us. Okay? They didn't even know. I mean, can you imagine, you and I find it hard to believe that all of us walking around here and that folks across the earth that don't even know where we are. But if you understood, especially those of you who are younger, if you understood the difference in the mass communication today and the lack of communication then, I mean, there was no way to make a telephone call across the ocean. That did not happen. You couldn't turn on the radio and find out what was happening in London. That did not happen. Okay? So it was very easy to hide us. As many of us as they were, it was very easy to hide us. Our folks did not know we were here. And those that came over here, by the time they got through brainwashing them, they didn't even know when they, if they ran into some of us that we were their folks. They had no idea that we belonged to them. And plus, remember, we've changed a lot. We've changed a lot. So they didn't identify with us. There were Muslims in and out of this country. Some of them tried to teach us. They went to jail. But most of them, they stayed over with the white folks. White folks made sure they stayed with them, didn't associate with us, didn't come into our neighborhoods for anything. So they had no way of understanding what was going on and that we were that tribe that was lost. <laughs> now, a man, again, through our yearning, was born who again had a job similar to Moses and Columbus. And therefore, Moses and Columbus were patterns for the preparation of this man for the job that he had to do. If this man is going to make the people who would be the Godhead, who would rule from now on, then that means he could not be restricted to wisdom to last 25,000 or 50,000 years. He had to be wise enough to convey a wisdom that would last forevermore. That means that he would personally have to have that wisdom. He was taken into some archives and he studied. His father used to get large, pay large sums of money 
getting books, books that are out of print, that were in people's private collections, limited editions, histories of great men. He studied greatness. It was his subject. He studied greatness. All greatness comes from God. Okay? When you understand the nature of greatness, you understand the nature of God. So Master Farad Muhammad spent 42 years preparing to come and get us. He was in and out of America 20 years before he revealed himself, who he was. He was all over this country and white folks thought he was just another white boy. He was listening and watching, taking notes, getting his stuff together. In the meantime, he had another project going. Our same little tight-eyed brothers, the Japanese, over on the Isle of Nippon. But he had them real dark Japanese. They were back there making something. And check this now. Now, this is not contrary to what I told you about the success of the Japanese today. Everybody working on it, nobody knew what they were making. Not one of them knew what the final project was going to look like, act like, or be. You say, well, that's the direct opposite of what you started off with. No, no, no. No, no, no. Not the direct opposite. They were full of zeal just as these Japanese are today because they knew that whatever they were doing, whatever it was going to be, was going to be for their benefit because they had trust in the ones who were giving them the instructions on what to do. So it didn't make any difference to them what it was going to be. They knew that if their leader told them to do this, it was going to be all right. Yakub's people had no idea. In fact, if some of them had known what they were going to come out like, they probably would have jumped over the board on the other ship and not made it. They had no idea what the final product was going to be 600 years later. Didn't even know it was going to be 600 years. They were like you and me. When he told them they were going to rule, they thought they were going to rule them all. They had known they weren't going to rule for 600 years through their descendants. They said, oh, hell, man, let me go back over here and live good. So he had to always dangle it in front of them like it's right around the corner. We're getting ready to take over, y'all, because they were like Negroes. I want my rat now, the mouthy kind, R-A-T, rat now. <laughs> Praise the good Allah. So, 1909, they began construction on this great marvel. The, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad described it as the wisest piece of machinery created since the creation of the universe. Okay, and you'll, I don't promise you a whole lot of teaching on that later, but you'll get some. <laughs> we will refer you to the books where the Adam Elijah Muhammad teaches on it, mostly. But we do have one tape here that we made some time ago. We've, I've only taught on it twice in my life, and the two lectures were 20 years apart. Okay, and the last one was, well, a couple of years ago, I think, wasn't it? And uh, I've got the tape here, and some of you have it, and we will make it available later on. We don't want to do it right now to everybody. It's called Identified Flying Objects, and in which we go into the details of that plane known as the mother plane or the mothership. But suffice it to say that after it took them 20 years, and after 20 years, they launched it. Just put it on up. Zoop, there it goes. Up went the plane, down went the stock market. <laughs> no economists, no battery of economists, no panel of economists have ever been able to sit down and lay out for you why the stock market crashed in 1929. There are no economic reasons for it to crash. The panic that came about has no basis in the marketplace. But all of a sudden, there was a panic among the wires of this world, and the stocks 
Christ and people jumped out of buildings and pulled, put guns to their heads and pulled the trigger. <laughs> the rest of them ran around town. They sure crazy. <laughs> yeah, we, didn't, we didn't know what they knew. All right. Master Farad Muhammad, then, is ready. But he has to produce another one. And as you go along, some of you already are pretty well along with it. Others of you will catch up with it. All of the prophecies that showed that he would have to work through somebody else. But he had to do that. And all of the scholars knew he had to do that. All of the scholars knew that when the almighty God came in person, that he would not linger long, he would not tarry long, but that he would prepare one in his absence to do the job. So consequently, when he began teaching, he began raising up his people. There were some folks who saw the design. There was one man who was the number two man with a group known as the Watchtower Society. <clears throat> the number one man was a man named Russell, but the number two man was a man named Judge Rutherford. Judge Rutherford, when Russell died, Judge Rutherford took over. It had never been known as anything but the Watchtower Society. But Judge Rutherford, who also was with Russell when they figured out the chronology and that, you know, 1914 was the end and all of that. He also figured out that it was time for the Almighty God to be here. He was wise enough not only to figure that out, but he watched and he figured out where he should be and who he was. And he contacted him. And he asked it in all humility. I know I'm not worthy to sit at the table with your other servant, but if I can just get a few crumbs that drop, teach me anything. Okay, I don't know how much correspondence they had, how close they got, but it's very interesting. I read a book recently by a white man out of Germany who had quit the Jehovah's Witnesses. And he said one of the things that they couldn't understand was, that they had been the Watchtower Society all this time. Then in 1931, Judge Rutherford changes it to Jehovah's Witness. And, he, and, you know, and they couldn't understand that. Why all of a sudden they became Jehovah's Witnesses. Who had witnessed Jehovah? <laughs> <laughs> Praises do to Allah. This is why you'll find that these folks are hard to deal with. Because they have enough truth that their lives are built on that they can fend you off unless you know what you're talking about. They can whip you to death if you don't know what you're talking about. They will take you dead to Spookville. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad recognized him on sight. You see, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, again, was born for his job. He was born with the spiritual eye. He only went to the third grade. But his father was a Baptist preacher, and his grandfather was a Baptist preacher. And so since he had to drop out of school to help work and take care of the family, he was illiterate. The way that he learned to read was by reading the Bible. So in this scheme of history, divine history, that we are helping to make, let us begin at the beginning. So well, how can you do that? Well, we do it just like the writer in the Bible did it. We just say in the beginning. <laughs> because when we examine that, it's, it's not really a clear picture. If you ask someone who studied the Bible say, uh, when the Bible opens up, what's, what happened in the beginning? What was the very first thing that happened? So God created the heaven and earth. Now that's not true. 
It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, right? Heaven and earth wasn't the first thing that happened. It said, in the beginning, God. Ha, ah, that's the first thing. That is the first thing. Then came the heavens and the earth. And when you study the history of Islam, where do you begin? What is the birth record of said nation of Islam? Okay. Doesn't say it doesn't have a birth. Doesn't say it was not born. Says it doesn't have a birth record. There's a whole lot of folks right here in New York City don't have birth records. Born out there in the stick somewhere, didn't get a birth certificate, didn't go to a hospital, and they got no birth record, but you're here, ain't you? Can't nobody say you were not born, because they know the only way you got here is that you were born. Therefore, you were born. Record or no record. Well, then why is there not a record? Well, what is Islam? Did Islam start 1,400 years ago as some of the Arabs refer to Prophet Muhammad as the holy founder, as if he founded a new religion? The Holy Quran does not say that. The Holy Quran says that the religion that Muhammad brought was the same religion that Abraham, Jacob, Jesus, Moses, and all the rest of the prophets had. But why is it that before then, None of them ever named a religion. Abraham never named, named a religion. Read his history. He never named a religion. Moses never named, named a religion. Jesus never named a religion. Only Muhammad. When Allah revealed to him that he had perfected the religion for us, only then did he name it. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says you don't trace a religion by its name or by using a calendar. You do it by how old is its precepts? How old are the concepts? Islam means entire submission to the will of God. When did submission to the will of God start? When did anything start submitting to the will of God? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad again says, Islam is as old as God himself, and God is the author of it. So when God started, Islam started. Because when God started, he started submitting to his own will, to no other will but his own. See, God submitting to anything? Yes. If he makes a law, he got to be the first law keeper. That's the difference between God and the devil. The devil sets up laws and then he purposely breaks them because he has the right to because he's the maker of the law. That's why you see police cars running red lights and they ain't going nowhere. You know, speeding down the street. You know, if it's dangerous for me to go 50 in a 20 mile zone, then it's dangerous for him to go 50 in a 20 mile zone. Because he got lights on his car, that don't make it no less dangerous. He can still kill somebody. In fact, they have several times just in the last year here in New York City. Okay? But that's the difference. But when God makes the law, he does not break that law. He is the example. All right. So then, what is the birth record then or, or, of God? Can't do it. How long ago was that, that God created himself? Can't tell. Why can't you tell? Secret? No, don't know. Why don't you know? Because he didn't know. <laughs> See, you and I come from good stock. When you find some of us who don't know exactly how old we are, that's good. The Creator didn't know exactly how old he was either. Why? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that because when he started the motion to create himself, that set time. Time is motion. Time is nothing but a measure of motion. Every way you measure time, you're measuring the motion of something. The earth, the sun, stars, and so forth. So all time is nothing but a measure of motion. So he set time into play from the beginning. But there was some time elapsed before he set up a mechanism to measure time. And once he set up the mechanism to measure time, he could not measure it backwards because there was no mechanism before then. So he could only begin then, and so therefore time began then. This is why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that yes, the black man had a beginning, 
but it was so long ago that time itself has erased it. Time erased. When? Because there was no mechanism to time it until God set it up. Therefore, everything that happened before this, it happened, but you can't measure how long. You don't know whether it was an hour, a day, or 50 trillion years, because there was no way to measure it up until he set up the measure. That's why we don't have a birth record. Our record only goes back to the beginning of time, and we existed before the beginning of time. They moved down into the jungles of East Asia to conquer the jungles and the wild beasts because the people who would be required in this day would have to be a unique people and there was not another people on earth that had dared go down in that jungle messing with those wild beasts and trying to live off the land because it was hard. You couldn't go in there and come out the same way. When you and I went in there, our, all our features changed. We didn't look like any other people on earth, and right today we don't look like any other people on earth. It changed our facial structure, changed our body structure, changed our hair. Look at our hair. And the sign that if our hair wasn't always all these different textures, look at our eyebrows. See? Eyebrows still straight. Don't care how kinky your hair is, your eyebrows stay straight. Sign of the original status of your hair. But going down there, eating what we ate, living like we lived, out in the weather and everything, changed the texture of our skin even. It was necessary. All this was the history of Islam. Once it moved, he moved his whole family down into the jungles. They wrote us right on out of the books. That's why when you go to Arabia today, or any of the Arab countries, Never find a Shabazz. No Shabazz. It took us right on out here. Forget him. You know, just leave him alone. Now, 6,000 years ago, our yearning finally produced one from within us who had the nature to bring all of this high technology into being. Why? Because it's costly, it's dangerous, it endangers human life, all of that. You had to have somebody with a mentality that put other things above human life. And you and I do not have that mentality. You and I respect the divinity of human beings too much to place something above the lives of people. Therefore, we had to produce somebody who didn't have the love of people that we have, somebody who was heartless, somebody with a nature so cold, they would wipe out whole cities just to discover one little interesting thing to make a toy for their children to play with. We had to make a cold-blooded devil. <laughs> so that happened. But remember, we didn't create him just for wickedness. We created him to accelerate some things that will still be here when he's gone. See, we're not talking about, yeah, get all the white folks away from here. We're going to throw away their television set. What the hell are we going to waste that for? All <laughs> <laughs> you have to do is take the filth off. That's a good box. That's a heck of a communication system. We'll throw away the telephone and them bad jets. Go, go back to going across on a camel. I don't dig no camels myself. <laughs> no way in the world you get me riding on one of them humps and getting all so old and stiff as I am. No, baby, give me a 797 if they ever get to that. <laughs> That's what we brought him here for. That would be a waste. We would have suffered all this time, all of this blood and sweat, tears and lies, lost for nothing if all of the good that we extracted from this Caucasian that we flushed, what they say, throw out the baby with the bath water. That's crazy. No, we, get, get, we got the goody out of him. Now, let's deal with him and keep the goody. Okay? See, this is maturity. We understand that God don't waste nothing. We begin to mature. Man, why he put these old evil white folks here? It wasn't just for the evil. It was for some other things. 
but he couldn't get the other thing without the evil. So he had to prepare a people. This man has so corrupted the rest of the earth. There is nobody on earth today outside of you and me who can overcome what this Caucasian has put in their minds and come into the rulership. None. None. Do you hear me? The scientists in Mecca are not qualified to rule. They cannot become qualified. They don't even have the capacity to be trained to rule behind this Caucasian. It took a special people, and it took 50,000 years to get them ready. And as no other people got our qualifications. There's no other people got the history in Africa, and no other people got the history in America. And there's no other people that can take over the rulership of this planet. Nobody else can handle it. And you see that wine oak out there stumbling? You see that junkie leaning? Ain't nobody on earth bad in here. You understand that? He can do something the baddest scholars on earth can't handle. Okay? <laughs> that's who we're dealing with. When we deal with each other, that's who we're dealing with. When we call each other God and you find the five percenters especially like to say that, that's not just a saying. We absolutely are God. This Caucasian absolutely has taken over the world and is the God of it. And in the crux is their real God, the God of them, the Jews. And in the crux of them is a little select circle of about 300 of them. That's the absolute power. No prophets, no messengers, no warners, no mujedit can deal with a God. It takes a God to deal with a God. And there's nobody else on earth that can be developed into God but us. Nobody else has the basic qualifications to build on but us. You can't make a God out of nothing else on this planet. I'm emphasizing that. Because we need to keep that deep in our minds at all times. No matter what happens, no matter what comes on us, no matter what opinion we have of each other and all of that, just remember, this is the God. And there's no other source from now on, forever. Nowhere else is God coming from but from out of you. Nowhere else. Ain't no other God, ain't none coming out of the Chinese, none coming out of the Japanese, ain't none coming out of the Sudan, ain't no God never coming from nobody but you. Okay? Now we can blow it if we want to as individuals, but we can't blow it as a nation. It's impossible. It's already in motion. Somebody going to make it, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, since somebody going to do it, why don't you do it? Yeah. <laughs> Some of us going to do it. So let's try to make it us instead of somebody else. Okay. So now here we are, the people destined to rule, who have sunk down to the lowest depths of any people. That's part of what qualified us to rule. You can never, ever, in all the annals of history, find anybody that was as degraded as we were. I don't care what them jabs you say about the Holocaust. Nobody. When you think about somebody who was stripped totally of all knowledge of themselves, you just don't find that. I mean, somebody who not, not only can't say their name, can't speak their language, don't even know what it is. Don't even know what it used to be. Don't have no idea. I mean, cut off completely. Nobody else has this ever happened to. But this is one of the things that qualifies us. Everybody else has always had a little link to their past. They've always got something they can go back and really trace their roots. <laughs> Not us, despite that stuff that Alex Haley did. A lot of that junk is fictitious. <laughs> the way the hell a nigga today traced himself all the way back to Africa. <laughs> no way. Can't be done. You're mixed up with too many things and too many people. You know that? But everybody else can do that. But we can't do it. Okay. Then what is the, what is the science in that? Science is very simple. If I take a tennis ball and I bounce it, I drop it right here on this rostrum it will bounce up so high. 
I can take the same ball and drop it on the floor and it will bounce higher. The further down it goes, the higher it has the capacity to rise. Since nobody has ever been down as low as us, nobody has the capacity to rise as high as us. Okay? So now, everything has to be done by a mechanism. Ain't no spook God, and ain't no spookism. Everything is done by a method that you can understand, thank you very much, that you can understand and explain. Okay? We didn't make these people for them to crawl around in no caves for 6,000 years. We made them to learn something from them. Learn of good and evil. You know, we got to do something. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, so we set them, Musa. So they rose up. They began to develop their systems, their religious system, which is the foundation of it all. Foundation of it all was the challenge. You know, well, if you got a God, where is he? Come, you don't never see him. You know? And then they start believing, they start putting out the spook God thing. God is a spook, he's a spirit. He ain't nothing. Well, once you determine that, that means, hey, he ain't nothing there, I must be the God then. Okay? So here come white folks. They got their thing together. So, they made a little move, and then they got locked up into their own European caves again. Only this time they were a little more sophisticated. They didn't forget their stuff. They stayed there. You know, they, they tried to spread out, but a man named Muhammad rose up, shut them up, roped them in. Then finally, after his influence waned, not just by accident, but because of his followers who began to corrupt his teaching. His teaching, again, could have held the Caucasians captive forever. They would never have been able to break out of the bonds of Europe and begin to colonize the world. They would never have been able to do it if his followers had held fast to exactly what he taught. But when his followers deviated from that which he taught, they became weak. And as they became weak, they began to be defeated. And when they began to be defeated, then the Caucasian began to dominate the world. There was a time when the Muslims used to charge white folks to sail the seven seas. Now, you know, God owns the seas. Then who can charge? God. That's right, right over there where Gaddafi is now. You could not sail by that port till you stopped and paid your tax. Otherwise, they take your ship. Might put you in slavery. You didn't pass by that till you paid your dues. You pay your toll. <laughs> That's right. That's the way it was. And it could have remained that way, except for the corruption of the Muslims. You see, when the Muslims conquered, went over to conquer Europe, they were fireballs. They hit Europe like a swarm of locusts. Nothing could stand before them. And all that the, the Caucasians could do in southern France and southern Italy and southern Spain was retreat. And they would try and they would burn down their fields and burn down their houses. That's where the scorched earth policy originated. Scorched the earth so they won't have nothing to live on. But you study, when you study European history, you'll find that their greatest hero is a man named Charles Martel who stopped, as they called it, the Moorish invasion. How did he stop it? Did he amass superior weapons, superior arms, superior men, manpower? No. Charles Martel studied the Muslims. And he told the Christians, he said, do not, do not scorch your fields. He said, when you leave your cities, he said, you can't stop them now because they are filled with religious zeal. That's his exact word. They are filled with religious zeal. Nothing can stop them now. The only way to stop them is to diminish their religious zeal. 
So Charles Martel told them this. He said, now, when you retreat from your cities, do not burn your fields. Do not take your gold. Leave your gold. Do not take, leave some of your women. Okay? And then desert it and let the Muslims come in and take over the rich grain fields, take over the money, and take over the white woman. He said, and when they begin to amass wealth and to become corrupt, they will begin arguing over the leadership. They followed Martel's plan. By the time they got almost to Vienna, Vienna, Austria, there they were, sitting up locked arm in arm with their white girls, rich and greasy and arguing about who's the boss. It's so when Martel moved on them and wiped them out. Wiped them out. Killed them, ran them back into the sea, did everything to them. Totally wiped them out because of their corruption. Because they did not stick to the tenets of their leader. Now I'm getting at something. The Caucasian going into the caves, having to be pulled out. Now, the way they broke loose, but even after they got them out of Europe, they still couldn't sally forth. They say, well, look, ain't no sense in us going down here trying to take over Africa and all down there. That's, that's out. Them, them niggas too bad. I mean, you know, we got them off of European soil, but we better not go down there messing with them. We tried that for 300 years and got wiped out. See, we need to find some place where they ain't. Okay? 